let's first of all get a quick sense of the room. How, how many of you are working in public relations right now? Uh, in agencies? On the client side? In where? What? Government. Government. Ah, government. I once asked that question. Uh, I asked that question, sort of, what do you want to do of a class at, uh, at a school in California? And, and I went through agency, government, public affairs, investor relations. None of them were working in any of those things. I was desperately confused. They were all working in entertainment PR. Is anybody working in entertainment PR? Oh, Lord. Okay. <laughs> No offense. Everybody wanted to be a celebrity publicist. Um, OK, cool. Because really not going to be a lot for you as, an enter as a celebrity publicist here tonight. Um, and and uh, so most of you are expecting to get a job in public relations when this is over? What's your, what's your feeling about the, the sort of job environment out there? Sparse. Oh, yep. Yeah. Cool. Okay. PR is expanding internationally. Mm -hmm. B2B business well, government, more than I think entertainment or sports. Right. Defense, medicine, cool. uh, developing countries, nonprofit. These are, I think, the areas where PR will expand. And as far as sort of what you're interested in, um, consumer marketing, corporate reputation, investor relations, public affairs. Government and uh -huh. community right. relations type of thing. Okay, yeah. Said, yeah. Political yeah. propaganda. <laughs> okay, cool. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I'm um, so I'm gonna talk a little bit about what's going on in the world out there, but I, I should probably finish the introduction that Shelley started. I always think that that my main fame claim to fame is that I've probably been associated with more failed public relations publications than anybody else <laughs> in the history of the planet. Um, and the deal is that um, I um, <coughs> completely by accident ended up working for PR Week in London. Um, actually, 25 years ago. This is my 25th year of writing about public relations, which is, no, no, it's, <laughs> it's, trust me, it's not a source of any great pride. Being introduced, I always think being introduced as sort of one of the foremost commentators on public relations is like being introduced as one of the world's tallest midgets. Uh, <laughs> it's nice, but the competition is just not that tough. Um, <laughs> But so I, I started work in PR Week in London. Um, after about 18 months, they sent me to New York to launch PR Week in the States, which was 1987. Uh, the fact of the matter is that I got here in January. Uh, we launched in February. We ran out of money in March. And we closed, I always say in April, but the truth is the second week of May. Um, and I didn't want to go back to London because I fell in love with the city. Um, and that was when I went to work for, for Adweek, uh, producing a public relations title for them. Did that for about a year and a half, and then somebody bought Adweek and wasn't particularly interested in public relations. So uh, I started my own business, uh, published a magazine called Reputation Management, which I think is the sophisticated magazine that you were talking about. Um, it was so sophisticated that it lost huge amounts of money. Um, <laughs> And after about 10 years, uh, my former business and I got an untidy divorce, and I ended up running a much smaller operation called the Homes Group. Uh, what we do today is publish report cards on the PR agency business um, in North America, Europe, and um, now Asia. Uh, run the, what has become the largest global awards competition for the PR industry, which is called the Sabre Awards. Um, the, the great thing about my job is that while I have never worked a day in my life practicing public relations, um, I get to, yeah, it's, uh, it's really, I'm, I, I would be a lousy PR person. We can talk about that later. Um, but um, I get to talk with more people who do public relations and more people who pay people to do public relations than probably anybody else I know. And so there's a wonderful quotation. I've been using this, as Shelley can probably testify, for 20 years. 
Um, and I still can't remember who I'm supposed to attribute it to. But somebody very smart once, says if you st once said, if you steal ideas from one person, it's plagiarism. If you steal them from more than one, it's research. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> this, is, uh, this is, therefore, an extraordinarily well-researched presentation, because the great thing about my job is that I get to steal ideas from hundreds, if not thousands, of people in this business who are way smarter about public relations than I am. And what I, what I want to talk to you uh, about tonight is the fact that, you know, as I'm sure you've, you've figured out for yourselves, um, the public relations business is at a real critical inflection point right now. Um, I want to talk about some of the reasons for that. Um, which, again, I suspect you've already figured out, but it's sort of fun to go through them. Um, and then I want to talk about one of the lessons that I've learned in 25 years writing about this business. Uh, because I, I think that the place that we're at right now presents an absolutely unprecedented opportunity for public relations. Um, there is no question in my mind that the ability to effectively manage the relationships between, stake between organizations and their stakeholders uh, is going to be infinitely more mission critical in the future, um, largely because of the social media landscape, but there are other issues as well, um, than it has been in the past. And that obviously presents a massive opportunity for those who believe that their job is to manage those relationships. Having said that, uh, as I say, 25 years writing about this business has taught me one thing above all others, and that is that there is no opportunity so vast that the public relations industry can't contrive to somehow fuck it up. Um, <laughs> sorry, we probably need to edit the tape, right? Um, oh. Okay. Um, this is an, this is a, an industry that, um, that, that has not always had the best leadership um, and has not always been aggressive enough in fighting its corner. Uh, both inside organizations and outside in the agency world. And so what I also want to do is spend a little bit of time talking about things that I think the industry needs to do in order to uh, prepare itself uh, and therefore take advantage of what I think is a massive opportunity. Well, let's talk first about the opportunity. Um, I think it's very easy to look at this as, uh, as a technology-driven revolution. Um, I actually am not entirely convinced that technology drives revolutions. I think people drive revolutions. Um, I think that the technology that is available to us today is a great enabler and a great accelerator of trends that were already taking place. Um, I was fond about 12 or 15 years ago of talking about the age of transparency. I'm also very fond of labeling things as the age of something, because we'll, <laughs> we'll probably get to another age of something in, in, in a few minutes. Uh, but, but a few years ago, I, I, I like to talk a lot about the age of transparency. Um, and again, none of this is going to come as a huge surprise to you, but, but in the time that I've been writing about business, um, the way in which business relates to the outside world has changed fairly dramatically. Um, my first job as a business writer was working on a local newspaper in the north of England. Um, and there were really only two kinds of stories that we were interested in. Uh, we were interested in, did your share price go up or down today? And we were interested in, is anybody on strike? Um, fortunately, this was during the Thatcher era in the UK, which none of you will remember. But trust me, uh, there was always somebody on strike. And otherwise, I don't know how we'd have filled the, the pages. Today, obviously, business media are interested in every conceivable aspect of your business behavior. They're interested in how you source the natural resources that go into your products. Um, there was a fascinating online crisis last week for Nestle. Uh, I don't know how many people followed that, but uh, Greenpeace launched a campaign against Nestle. Uh, which demonstrated, maybe we'll talk about this later on, uh, which demonstrated fairly conclusively that even a sophisticated multinational company that has plenty of experience dealing with boycotts and corporate campaigns uh, still doesn't quite understand how to respond when social media are involved. Um, they're interested in how many adorable uh, Asian children are working in your suppliers' factories. 
They're interested in how many women you have on your board of directors. They're interested in how you treat your minority employees. They're interested in every single aspect of your organization's behavior. Um, at the same time, there are a growing number of NGOs out there who are fascinated, again, with every aspect of your organization's behavior. Um, I, I find the sort of NGO phenomenon intriguing. Um, one of, the, one of the first assignments I had when I was working for PR Week in London uh, was to go out and write a thousand word story about the Sugar Industry Association. Um, and I was walking across town wondering how you could possibly get a thousand words out of sugar because essentially once you've communicated the fact that it's sweet, uh, <laughs> I really don't think there's a lot else to say. I got there to find that the five-person PR department of the Sugar Industry Association spent its entire life dealing with a group that had set itself up across town with the sole objective of persuading people that sugar was the source of all evil. Um, it, uh, it, was, uh, it was the cause of diabetes, it was the cause of hyperactivity in children, it was just basically a bad thing. And I walked away from this with uh, two lessons that have stuck with me for the rest of, uh, of my business life. One is that there are an awful lot of people out there who don't have a life, and the other is that until they get one, they're going to do everything they can to make yours just as miserable as theirs. Um, that's a, that's a obviously slightly glib dismissal of the NGO sector, which also does a lot of good. But there are some pretty obscure groups out there. My favorite, I, I, I don't know how new this, this is probably the same material I was using last time we met. Um, but one of my favorite cases involved uh, uh, an insurance company, um, Aetna. A few years ago, a friend of mine was running corp comms for Aetna, and they ran a, an advertising campaign, uh, the goal of which was to persuade children to go in and get their shots against all kinds of unpleasant diseases. Um, and on once, the, the, the ads were all print <coughs> ads. They were really kind of, for the insurance industry at least, pretty creative. On one side of the page, uh, there was an image of something that children are traditionally as uh, afraid of. So uh, in some ads, it was a Frankenstein monster. In some, it was a vampire. In some, it was a witch. In some, it was a werewolf. On the other side of the page uh, was the text, which said basically these are the things that your kids are afraid of. But what they really ought to be afraid of are all of these diseases. Send them in to get their shots. Uh, the ad had been running for about a month when the first boycott threat arrived at Aetna's headquarters. Anybody want to guess who the boycotters were? Wiccans? Spot on. Very good. Nobody ever gets that. I've even had vampires, but nobody ever gets Wiccans. Uh, the American Federation of Wiccans was outraged at the uh, negative stereotyping of witches contained in this advertisement. The witch was portrayed as an elderly woman uh, with slightly greenish skin, a long pointy nose, a rather protruding chin, more warts than would ordinarily be considered attractive on a woman. Um, and this was contributing to the negative image of witches in our society. Um, I have to say that I was completely unprepared for the fact that witches had a negative image due to the fact that my only exposure to them was through Buffy the Vampire Slayer, and I thought they were all hot teenage girls. Um, but but the, the, the truly scary thing about this story, and then I'll, I'll move on because it's a frivolous story, but the truly scary thing about this story is that Aetna actually decided that they were going to pull the ad. Um, they were apparently so intimidated by the combined economic might of America's witches uh, <laughs> that they, or maybe there was some other means of protesting that these women had at their disposal that was even more scary. Um, they decided they were going to pull the ad. Um, I mention that because I do think that there's an interesting lesson to be learned from this. Um, and, and I think one of the mistakes we make as an industry uh, is believing that public relations is a popularity contest and that good public relations means making everybody love you all the time. And good public relations is not that. Good public relations is deciding what it is you stand for and then standing for it. And occasionally, if you stand for something, there are going to be a lot of people who disagree with you. Um, that is the price you pay for having values. And having the value we never want to piss off anybody at any time for any reason um, simply makes you look wishy-washy, as I think was the case for Aetna. Uh, but this was an illustration of just how many um, interest groups there are out there focused on your organization's behavior, determined to get publicity um, 
which they can achieve by attacking an organization. Um, and, um, and focused on the most obscure issues. I remember around the same time, somebody threatened to boycott ITT, which is now a client of yours, mm -hmm. because they used Handel's Messiah as the background music in an ad campaign, and that was sacrilegious. There was a campaign that featured um, aquatic animals. Um, I, I don't even remember. It was an environmental ad campaign. It featured environment, uh, aquatic. Oh, because of the water. Yeah, okay. they did water purification, right? right? right. And, uh, and they used Handel's Messiah as the theme music to it and were threatened with a boycott. <laughs> so um, I guess the great lesson is that you can't stay out of the way of these organizations. Um, you can only hope to deal with uh, whatever comes your way in a values-driven kind of uh, uh, mode. Um, the other thing that's happened to increase and expand transparency is the rise of the internet um, and its ability to make local stories global almost overnight. Um, and you know, I, I think it's difficult to overestimate how this has made life more difficult for corporate communicators. Um, as an illustration, there, I was in China just before the Olympics um, a couple of years ago. And at a time when Coca-Cola found itself being threatened with a pretty significant boycott. And uh, what had happened was that a group of Chinese students had been backpacking in Germany. And at a small railway station in the middle of Germany had seen an old poster advertising Coca-Cola. And on the old poster advertising Coca-Cola was a roller coaster uh, right at the top of the thing about to plunge down into one of those kind of loops that roller coasters have. And I'm just not up on the roller coaster lingo. And, uh, and sitting in the roller coaster were a bunch of individuals who had their arms up and had big smiles on their faces of excitement and joy. And the only problem was that they were all Tibetan monks. Now, uh, this was an, an ad campaign that was three years old. Uh, most of the posters had been taken down, but in this particular rural train station, nobody had bothered to replace it, nobody had sold anything to paste over it, and so the ad was still there. Uh, one of the Chinese students took a photo of the ad, posted it to the bulletin boards in China, which are pretty much the Chinese equivalent of the blogosphere and the Twitter sphere that, that you and I know, uh, with a note that says, Coca-Cola is campaigning on behalf of the Tibetans, boycott them now. More than 10,000 Chinese students had signed uh, a letter um, in support of a boycott of Coca-Cola, which was a major Olympic sponsor, before anybody in Coca-Cola's PR department knew that there was even a story. Um, by the time the company got around to responding and explaining, um, the Chinese youth was uh, just furious at the company. Um, it took about six months to calm them down and persuade them that Coca-Cola was not actually campaigning against China. Um, and it's, to me, a, a really powerful example of how a story can, can travel halfway around the world and how misperceptions can travel halfway around the world uh, before an unalert company, um, and I'm sure Coca-Cola is much more alert today than it was <coughs> 18 months ago, can figure it out particularly when it's in a foreign language, particularly when it's in a medium that you're not intimately familiar with. Um, and so, so what we have is media and NGO scrutiny of business, coupled with a mechanism that allows intensely local stories to become national stories and global stories almost under, overnight, leading, leading to what I think is a, an absolutely radical transparency for business, certainly compared to 10 or even five years ago. But there's something else that's going on out there um, which I think creates a, an even more challenging environment for organizations. And that is that most companies, all companies, whether they acknowledge it or not, have lost control of their brand and their reputation. Um, I think that five years ago, it was still possible for marketers and corporate communicators to believe that the brand was the sum of all the things that they said about themselves. 
that your brand was defined by your advertising, first and foremost, by your logo, by your press releases, by your sponsorships, by all the things that you as an organization told people about yourself. What's happened over the last five years is that it's become painfully obvious that your brand today is defined by all the things that people say about you after you've left the room. Your brand is determined by all of those conversations that are taking place out there online and in the real world. And if there's one thing that I'd like to kind of dispel from our industry, it's this notion that social media and digital media are the same thing. There are a great many social media uh, that exist outside the digital realm. We are engaging in one of them right now. This is, to a certain extent, social. Um, once I've run out of things to say, it will presumably get a little more social. Um, there are plenty of digital media um, that are not particularly social. Uh, you know, I don't find them particularly interesting. Most of them involve banner advertising and other not, not very exciting stuff. But there are clearly digital media that are not social. But social media, broadly defined, um, has always been there. Um, we've all always had conversations about the brands we love and probably um, more typically the brands we hate. Um, today, however, it is increasingly difficult. Well, first of all, those conversations are amplified because there are just so many more ways for them to take place, so many more ways for you to connect with people who feel the same way. Um, and secondly, because and secondly, they become increasingly difficult to ignore. And so, you know, we're living in a world where if you're an organization and you type your name into a search engine, you're going to find plenty of those conversations taking place. Um, now, I'm not sure that I think that social media have changed the rules of public relations. Um, I think. Let me think about this for a second. Let me talk about this for a second because I think this is an important subject. I think um, I don't think that, that social media have changed the rules of public relations, which is to say that I think all the things that were good practice in public relations 10 years ago are good practice in public relations today. Um, it was always good practice to listen more than you talked. Nobody did it, but it was always good practice. I don't do it. Um, I will later, I promise. Um, it was always good practice to listen more than you talked. It was always good practice to be honest. It was always good practice to sound like a human being and not a piece of legalese. Um, it was always good practice to engage and build relationships with your consumers uh, rather than spinning them in order to achieve a transactional objective. All these things have always been good practice. Uh, what's changed is that if you don't follow good practice today, you will be discovered much more swiftly than you would five years ago, and you will be punished much more severely than you would five years ago. And that's a result of social media. That's, that's the thing I believe that social media has changed uh, for our business. But it is a pretty seismic change. Um, and the industry is going to have to make some pretty major changes in order to adapt to that environment. Um, both our industry and business as a whole are going to have to make some fairly major changes. Um, and I think, I think at this point I want to talk about some of the things that, that I think are critical to the future of our business. Um, and this is probably not going to be in any particular order. Um, the first thing that I think <laughs> has to happen is that the role and the function of well, the first thing that has to happen is that corporate communicators have to take responsibility for social media. Um, I think that, that what has happened in the last couple of years, that most of the major agencies have recognized the importance of social media, uh, the way in which it's going to change the business, and have reshaped their firms to a greater or lesser extent in order to meet that challenge. I think the agency business has actually been quite progressive when it comes to social media, which is not to say that it hasn't made mistakes. But I actually think that making mistakes in the social media environment is in many ways a good thing. I think, it's, I think you, the, the companies that I would consider to be pioneers in social media have largely become pioneers because they screwed up really badly and therefore figured out that they had to do things differently. Um, Dell is probably the most outstanding example, a company that went through a major crisis because of its lack of responsiveness and has, as a result of that crisis, really reoriented its whole public relations and customer service 
operation around social media in order to, to, to sort of engage more effectively with its stakeholders. So I actually think that there are some advantages um, to screwing up in the social media environment. Um, unfortunately, um, while, the, uh, while the PR agencies have done a pretty good job in that respect, I think corporate PR departments uh, have been painfully slow. Um, I think uh, I, have a, I have a sort of rather glib summary of what I think's happened inside corporations, which is that I think marketers look at social media, they see only opportunity, and their first inclination is to use it as a media, a, cha a channel through which they can communicate. Um, if I was being, if I was being really glib, I'd say, um, you know, the, the, and I am, the, the marketers look at marketers look at social media. They see only opportunity, and they want to talk as much as possible, because uh, that's what marketers do. They tell you about themselves. Corporate communicators um, look at social media. They see only risk, and all they want to do is listen. So what you have is an environment in which marketers are trying almost everything. I mean, there was a period before the, before the, the downturn started. There was a period when the marketing approach to social media appeared to be to throw everything on the wall and see what stuck. So it was, you know, let's, let's create a funky chicken and make it go viral. Um, let's do a bunch of banner advertising. Let's get a Facebook page. Let's post all of our videos on YouTube. Let's buy an island in Second Life and see who comes to visit us. <laughs> Trust me, there are more barren islands and <laughs> Second Life as a result of that than, than there are anywhere in the real world these days. Um, meanwhile, corporate communicators looked at it and said, Jesus Christ, there are all kinds of things going on out there that have the potential to bite my company in the ass. I better listen. And so they're sitting on the sidelines. They are lurking. They are monitoring. But they are not, for the most part, engaging. Now, you won't be particularly surprised to hear that I think that the correct response to, to the rise of social media lies somewhere between those, those two extremes. Um, I think it's important to listen, but I don't think it's sufficient to listen. I think at some point you have to go out there and engage and start talking to people and start presenting a, a face for your organization. And the, the problem that I see in corporations is probably best summed up by a conversation that I had with a guy in London about nine months ago. Um, this is a guy who runs corporate communications for a Fortune 50 company in what I think we could politely describe as an issues-rich environment. What that means is everybody hates them. Um, and uh, I, was, I was having lunch with him, um, and I knew that he had been approached by his agency uh, a month or so earlier with this idea of creating a, a sort of global community um, online where all of the people who are interested in the organization, its stakeholders and particularly its critics, could come and congregate and hold conversations. I thought this was a rather smart idea. Um, and so conversation turned to this online community and I said, I know your firm has pitched you on this, are you going to do it? And he shook his head sadly and said no. And so I said, why? And he had uh, a wonderful rational explanation. He said, well, if I create an online community and bring all our critics together in one place, two things will happen and two things won't happen. The two things that will happen are that we will just find a cacophony of criticism in one place. We're going to find all of these people who are having conversations about us, having those conversations in one place, and it's going to be deafening. And I said, as I suspect you would, <coughs> all of these people are having those conversations anyway. Wouldn't you rather have them in a place where you can monitor them and engage with them and be a participant in the discussions? You can correct mistakes, and you can address shortcomings, and you can generally be uh, part of the discussion um, rather than pretending that it doesn't exist. And uh, he shook his head sadly as if I was being colossally naive um, and explained that that wouldn't work because the second thing that would happen is that his CEO would log into this community every morning, drive into work in his nice chauffeur-driven car, reading the FT and the Wall Street Journal, get up to his office, turn on his computer, 
um, and log into this site to find out what was being said, and then inevitably demand that the corporate communications guy change the tone of the conversation. The two things that wouldn't happen, he told me, were that he wouldn't get a bigger budget. In other words, he'd have to manage this out of his existing uh, financial situation. And he wouldn't get any more responsibility. And that, it seems to me, is the key element of the discussion. Because if, as a communications person, you can't do anything to address the real substantive complaints that stakeholders have about your organization, um, complaints that are much more likely to be about you um, turfing um, Nigerian tribes people off their land so that you can drill for oil, or uh, pumping waste materials into the North Sea, um, or killing seals, or whatever it is that your organization is doing that people don't like. Unless you as a corporate communications person have the authority to change that, um, there's really not much point in engaging with anybody because at the end of the day, um, you're not going to be able to meet their expectations or the expectations of your senior management team. I listened to this and I understood it and I thought it was actually pretty sad. And so I said, that's pretty sad. <laughs> and uh, I said, you know, you're one of, the, one of the most senior public relations people in the UK. Uh, this is a guy who's gotten lifetime achievement awards from, you know, dozens of different people, including us. Very respected individual. I said, uh, you know, if you can't fight this battle, um, if you can't go into your CEO and explain to him why this is important, why you need to do it, why you need more money, why you need more authority, who can? And he said, oh, I could probably do it, but I retire in three years, and really it's not worth the effort. <laughs> and, uh, and, and I, you know, my, my great concern is that that was not an isolated conversation. Um, my great concern is that, for the most part, people in corporate communications department lack both the budget and the balls to do anything about social media in a meaningful way. And so my great, co my great concern is that social media is going to be taken over by marketers rather than by corporate communicators. Um, and given um, our discussion, well, I, I should also explain, Shelley um, indicated that I believe that advertising is a subsidiary function of public relations, which of course I do. Um, advertising is a tool, public relations is a process. Uh, tools should report to processes, not the other way around. Uh, it seems to me to be almost self-evident, uh, unfortunately not to the entire mass of corporate America. Um, I should also make it clear that I have always considered marketing to be a subset of public relations too. Marketing is about building a relationship between an organization and its customers. Public relations is about building a relationship between an organization and all of its stakeholders, of whom one happens to be customers. Um, but it worries, but clearly that's a nice sort of philosophical point of view to have. It doesn't reflect how the real world is structured. And uh, most of you are unfortunately going to have a live in the real world, uh, unlike me. Um, and so we won't waste too much time on my philosophy. Um, so I am greatly concerned that, um, that corporate communicators are going to lose out on the whole social media revolution. Um, I'm actually also mildly concerned about the term corporate communications, um, or to be a little more specific, about the um, abandonment within organizations of the term public relations. I actually like the term public relations. I think it means exactly what it says, which is building relationships between organizations and their publics. I think communication, corporate communications is a somewhat inadequate substitute for public relations because I don't think that, that relationships are built primarily through communications. I think the relationships are built primarily through behavior. Um, I think that uh, you know we all know this in our personal lives. We all understand that if I tell Shelley how much I love her while turning my back on her and walking out of the room, she's going to believe my actions rather than my words. Um, I think you know we can we can all see examples in the world around us today that actions um, are a much more powerful form of um, and behaviors are a much more powerful form of, of building relationships um, than words. Um, you know, it's sort of intriguing to me to watch uh, one of the world's most powerful and in many ways respected institutions, the Roman Catholic Church, trying to figure this out right now. 
um, you know, when you have an organization that has been under criticism for, the, for exactly the same problem for about 10 years, has seen it pop up in the US, um, in, um, uh, in Ireland, and now in Germany, and continue to respond to it in the same way, which is to say, um, defensively, um, to, uh, to blame the media for attacking the Catholic Church rather than to blame the priests for attacking small boys <laughs> uh, just seems to me to be perverse um, to the point of absurdity. Um, and it, the interesting lesson, by the way, for me in what's going on right now in the Catholic Church is that you can, in fact, be too concerned for your reputation. Um, almost everything that the Catholic Church has done has appeared to me to be about protecting the Catholic Church. Um, I would argue that in a crisis, that ought to be pretty much the last thing on your agenda. Um, and that if you do all the other things that you should be doing, um, apologize, acknowledge uh, the scope of the problem, um, act upon it, demonstrate standards of accountability, um, then the reputational stuff takes care of itself if you appear to be focused exclusively on protecting your reputation, you almost by definition won't. Um, so, I think that there are certain things that need to happen within organizations. And the first thing that needs to happen is that the, the corporate reputation management function has to be consolidated. Because the problem that, that I think we have today is that reputation is managed in, in, in many uh, diverse corners of an organization at a time when it's absolutely essential that it be managed centrally. Um, and so you have in a lot of organizations a structure where your, your reputation with customers is being managed by the marketing department, your relationship with shareholders is being managed by the finance department, your relationship with the government is being managed by the legal department, your relationship with employees is being managed uh, by the human resources department. I think that we have to recognize that relationship, reputation, management, whatever you want to call it, public relations is as good a term as any, um, has to be managed centrally. Uh, we're living in a world where all of those stakeholders interact, um, where, um, where you know, your customers may also be shareholders, um, your employees may be shareholders, your shareholders may buy the products that you, buy, that, that, that you sell. The people who buy the products that you sell live in communities where you have either stores or factories. The people who live in communities where you have stores or factories see your employees every day of the week. Um, we are also clearly now living in an environment where the lowest paid employee in your organization can, in one stupid moment, undo all the work that the public relations department does uh, with its seven-figure budget. And so um, a flight attendant on Southwest Airlines throwing Kevin Smith off the plane because he's even wider apparently than I am um, can do more damage to your reputation um, than the PR department can undo um, in, in the course of a six-month period. And uh, just to be clear, I'm, I'm, I'm not entirely sure that Southwest Airlines is wrong on the merits on that issue, um, but I do think that uh, it was a badly mishandled crisis. Um, and so um, I think that when you don't have all of these functions in one place, um, bad things are going to happen to your, worst case scenario, bad things happen to your organization. Best case scenario, you miss out on opportunities for synergy. I also think that, that we have to recognize that in today's world, employees as brand ambassadors play a much more vital role than they ever have in the past. Um, you know, I think that this is, this is an indication how the world of marketing is changing. And you'll, you'll have to forgive me for what is, I know, a fairly esoteric example. But about five or six years ago, I don't know how many of you remember the McDonald's campaign. The McDonald's campaign, the tagline of which was, we love to see you smile. OK. Now, you have presumably all been told that a brand is a promise. Um, employees are the ones responsible for keeping a brand promise. And I've always been sort of fascinated with the brand promise idea. And I was particularly intrigued by the McDonald's brand promise. I actually thought it was a slightly silly promise, but McDonald's made it. Who am I to disagree? Um, now, I have a problem, which is that I eat at McDonald's way more than I ought to. 
Um, I have another problem, which is that the McDonald's I eat at way more than I ought to is in Times Square. Um, but I started going into the Times Square McDonald's, and I figured I would try and find out whether McDonald's was capable of living up to its brand promise. Did they, in fact, want to see me smile? <laughs> so. At first I went into McDonald's and waited for some indication that somebody behind the counter cared about my facial expression. Uh, interesting fact, difficult to make eye contact with anybody at McDonald's, but I thought maybe it's me. Maybe I'm not trying hard enough. You know, maybe I just didn't look like the kind of guy who wanted to smile. So I started going into McDonald's with a smile on my face, thinking, you know, maybe I'll get a little smile in return. Wouldn't that be nice? Nothing. Eventually, I started going to McDonald's with a big, loopy grin on my face. Hi there, I'd love a Big Mac with everything, french fry. I was closer to getting arrested than I was to getting a smile from anybody in McDonald's. Now, I think we can all agree that whether somebody in McDonald's smiles at you is, in the grand scheme of things, not a particularly critical issue. At the same time, this seemed to me to be interestingly symbolic of the way in which organizations approach their brand, and the way in which advertising agencies in particular approach the issue of branding, which is that they assumed that their job ended when they'd written the jingle and put together the tagline and thrown up a 30-second commercial that everybody thought was just groovy. Um, unfortunately, that's not how the world works. Now, in this particular instance, it didn't have a huge impact. But if you're dealing with an organization where customer service is critical, um, whether that's in-person customer service, an airline, a hotel, um, or online customer service, or telephone customer service, a computer maker, uh, the fact of the matter is that if you make a promise, you better be damn sure that your employees are prepared to keep it. Um, and employees can also be powerful ambassadors on the corporate reputation front. Um, another interesting story, about, about two years ago, maybe even longer, I have a very bad sense of time, about two years ago there was a story about GlaxoSmithKline uh, teaching its employees to be ambassadors for the pharmaceutical industry. Uh, the pharmaceutical industry, um, as we all know, makes products that prolong, uh, enhance, and um, save lives. So everybody hates it. And uh, so in an attempt to rescue its severely damaged reputation, it decided that it would um, train employees to go out as ambassadors into the community and talk about all the good that the pharmaceutical industry did, to explain why pharmaceutical prices are as high as they are, um, to, to you know, generally sort of uh, fight the good fight on behalf of the industry. Um, I called up a friend of mine at a rival pharmaceutical company. Um, which will remain nameless to protect the stupid, and said, you know, doesn't this sound like a great idea? Are you going to do anything similar? And he said, oh, we would never do that. He said, it's far too risky. And I said, define risky. He said, you send all these people out there. You have no idea what they're going to say on your behalf. They're going to be out there as ambassadors for the company. They could say entirely the wrong things. They could screw up. And it seemed to me entirely clear that this guy was living in a fantasy life where you know, pharmaceutical em company employees never talked about their job <laughs> unless you specifically said you are now empowered to do so. Like at a cocktail party, if somebody would say, where do you work, they'd go, I don't know. <laughs> sort, of like, sort of like when Homer Simpson went into the, try and get, try and get Mr. Burns's mail from the post office, and they said, what's your first name? And he goes, I don't know. I, just a wonderful Simpsons moment. Um, anyway, apropos of absolutely nothing, except I feel the need to throw in pop culture references. Um, so we have, you know, we have this environment uh, in which in which employees uh, need to be empowered. And, and I think employees are a much neglected audience in corporate communications. I think that's going to change over the next few years. They're going to move to the forefront. Um, now, so I think that the, the next thing that has to happen, as I said, is that corporate communications has to be consolidated within the organization. Uh, the second thing is that it has to start to um, impose itself on an organization um, and on organizational decisions in a way that perhaps it traditionally hasn't done. I've made the case that reputation is mostly about behavior. What that means is that public relations has to be mostly about policy. Uh, that means that public relations has to have a role in policy making and decision making, not merely in communicating policy. 
Um, I'll give you a quick story, which I think illustrates why this is important. Um, you'll have to forgive me. I've lived my entire adult life in London and New York, two cities in which you have to be in almost insane to own a car. Mm -hmm. So I don't really know anything about cars, and this is a car story. So bear with me if the details sound a little funky. Uh, but a few years ago, there were a series of incidents in, involving um, one of Ford's trucks. I think it was the Ford Bronco. And the problem that Ford had was that its Broncos were rolling over uh, slightly more often than most of us would like to see happen. Um, and people who were victims of this rollover sued. One of the reasons that they sued was that Ford had um, uh, come up with a nifty design solution uh, to uh, what it perceived as a problem. Um, many trucks are equipped with something called a rollover bar, which is uh, intended to stop them rolling over. Ford didn't have a rollover bar, but it did have something that the designers charmingly called a rollover bar effect. What this meant was that there was something underneath the car that was designed to look like a rollover bar, but served absolutely no purpose except the cosmetic. Um, Ford was found guilty. It was a pretty embarrassing case for them. Um, they apologized profusely, handled the aftermath pretty well. And um, I took the occasion to write an article. Uh, for, I was writing a column for PR Week, the one that launched after the failed one that I created um, and is doing much more successfully than, than mine ever did. Um, they had me writing a column. Uh, for them a few years ago. And so I wrote a column for PR Week, and I said that this was a failure of public relations. And what I said was that I felt that somebody from the public relations department should have been in the room when the decision was made uh, to create this rollover bar effect and said, hey, guys, that's a really stupid idea. Um, and there were, as, it, as there nearly always are in these cases, it seems to me only three possibilities. The first possibility was that nobody ever asked PR. That seems to me to be the most likely possibility. The second possibility was that they asked public relations, and public relations said, go ahead. We think a rollover bar is a really nifty idea, in which case the PR people should all be fired. Mm -hmm. The third is that they asked the public relations people. The public relations people said, that's colossally stupid. They went ahead and did it anyway, in which case the PR department should have resigned on the spot, because obviously it's not being taken seriously. Um, none of those three things, however, speaks well for the role of public relations within Ford at the time. Anyway, so I wrote this column saying that, uh, saying that I thought that, uh, that, that the public relations people should have been involved in product design at Ford Motor Company and received in response a single incredulous letter from a friend of mine actually on the West Coast. Um, and the tone of the letter was uh, severe uh, exasperation with me. And basically the, the letter said, you know, Paul Holmes has been lecturing us for years that PR should be counseling the CEO. And Paul Holmes thinks that PR people should be counseling the investor relations department to make sure that you know, all the numbers are, are accurate. And, you know. and Paul Holmes thinks we should be, should be lecturing human resources people on how to communicate with employees. Paul Holmes thinks we should be uh, involved in setting public policy in Washington and making sure that legislators love us. And now Paul Holmes wants us to make sure that the product's safe as well. Is there no end? Is there no end to what Paul Holmes thinks public relations people should be doing? Sounds like a reasonable question. Except, let me suggest to you that if I'd written this letter for a legal publication, it would have been pretty much unthinkable for a lawyer to write in and say, geez, first Paul Holmes wants us to make sure that what the CEO does is legal. Then he wants us to make sure that what the CFO does is legal. <laughs> then he wants to make sure that our, our human resources policies are legal. Then he wants to make sure that our, our lobbying activities are legal. Now he wants us to make sure that the product's legal as well. Is there no end to what Paul Holmes wants the legal department to do? Well, you know what? If a decision has the ability to impact your legal standing, then sure, a lawyer should be involved in making that decision. If a decision has the ability to impact your relationship with a key stakeholder, making that decision without recourse to a public relations person is criminal stupidity. And what we see in far too many organizations is an environment in which, see, I believe every time a decision is made, there are four broad sets of implications. There are financial implications, 
There are operational implications, there are legal implications, and there are relationship implications. The first three sets of implications are considered routinely and formally by every organization under the sun. The fourth set of implications is an afterthought at nearly all of them. And it's colossally stupid. And as I said earlier, in the social media environment, being that stupid is going to cost you much more quickly and much more severely than it would have done 10 or 15 years ago. And it suddenly occurs to me that I've been talking for about as long as I was told to talk. So I'm going to run through four or five other things very quickly that I think our industry needs to take care of. The first and most critical challenge is recruiting the best and the brightest. And the big issue that we have to address as an industry is an understanding of the way in which business works. And I'd say that this was true regardless of whether you're going to work in government or, um, or entertainment or sports or politics or any other arena, understanding the real way in which decisions get made and, which organize, and, and, and how organizations make money and achieve their objectives is, is just critically important. Um, because we don't have enough time, I'm not going to use this as a platform to rail against the fact that public relations is still being taught in journalism schools rather than business schools, except to say that I think it's an abomination and as long as it continues, we'll always be regarded as a second-rate discipline within organizations. I am going to say that I have never heard a CEO say the problem with my PR team is that they just don't understand the media. I have heard them say time and time again, the reason that I don't have my PR guy at the table when decisions are made is because the PR guy doesn't understand business. Um, the second thing is, once we've hired them, we have to treat, teach them a few critical skills. The one that I am relentlessly focused on, the one that I think differentiates PR counselors from PR people, is courage. I think the one characteristic that PR people need is the guts to stand up in a room when nobody wants to hear it and tell the CEO that he's acting like an asshole. You do not necessarily need to use the word asshole. <laughs> the fact that I do is one of the reasons why I lecture about this stuff rather than actually practicing it. <laughs> Nevertheless, the point remains. You know, I remember, I remember seeing a story when the Enron crisis broke, which I can't believe is more than 10 years ago. Um, I remember seeing a story <coughs> that said, when the consultants at Anderson in Houston wanted to make more money uh, from their client Enron, all they had to do was tell it what it wanted to hear. And I remember thinking that the word that didn't belong anywhere in that sentence was consultants. That's pretty much the opposite of what a consultant does. What a consultant does is go into the room and tell people what they don't want to hear. And that's, that requires a lot. It, it requires several things. It requires knowledge. Um, obviously, it requires judgment um, because you don't want to do it all the time. Um, I'm actually not a big fan of the idea that PR people should be the conscience of the corporation because in my experience, most corporations don't want a conscience. What consciences do is nag. Um, and uh, who wants an institutional nag? And more to the point, who's going to invite somebody whose job it is to nag to sit at the main table and make decisions? Uh, so I think we always have to be focused on the pragmatic reasons uh, why our advice is sound advice. Having said that, I think that ethical behavior and good public relations advice overlap to the point that they are almost indistinguishable. If something is unethical, it is almost certainly at some point in the time going to come back and bite you in the ass and be a bad decision for pragmatic reasons too. Um, and I really believe that. Um, what else do I need to focus on? Um, there is, I think, also an urgent need for those of us in this business to come up with a standard industry mechanism for measuring the impact of what we do on brand and reputation. Um, you know, every time we go into a recession like the one that we are hopefully coming out of, um, I sit down with PR people who tell me that public relations is counter cyclical. And the reason public relations is counter cyclical, they tell me, is that it is so much more cost effective in advertising than advertising. In an environment uh, in which dollars are hard to come by, 
sensible clients are going to take $10 million out of their advertising department, put $100,000 of it into public relations, and get exactly the same results. And people tell me this with absolute confidence. I don't know anybody in the public relations business who doesn't believe that that's true. Not that clients will do it, but that public relations is that much more um, effective, cost effective than advertising. It doesn't happen. And the reason it doesn't happen is that while we all know it to be true, we've never actually bothered to sit down and prove it to any of our clients. When times are good, we don't bother proving it because budgets are great anyway and we don't need any more money. When times are bad, we don't bother pr proving it because it's too damn expensive. And so we go on and on believing this to be true without ever convincing anybody outside of our own narrow little circle. Um, I'm not sure that there is any definitive answer to how public relations should be measured. Uh, but over the last two years, I have become a huge fan of um, an approach based on the work of, and I have no idea whether you, this name is going to mean anything to anybody in this room, a guy called Fre Fred Reichheld. And Fred Reichheld is the author of a brilliant little book called The Ultimate Question. And what The Ultimate Question um, does is distill corporate reputation down to a single question. Uh, or brand reputation, or uh, which is, um, how likely are you to recommend this company, product, service, employer, um, whatever, um, to a friend? And Reichheld's research shows in a pretty robust way. By the way, the one the one thing that I wish I'd spent more time studying when I was younger, well, pretty much everything, but the one thing that I really wish I'd spent more time studying when I was younger is statistics. Um, well, you know what? It's, it's the basis of empirical knowledge, and you've got to have some of that in this business these days. Um, but what Reichel's work shows, um, using a variety of techniques, is the answer to that question is a powerful predictor of future performance. Uh, he has come up with a concept called the Net Promoter Score. And the Net Promoter Score is essentially the number of people who are advocates for your brand, which is to say the number of people who give you an 8, 9, or 10 I think actually just a 9 or 10 in response to that question, minus the number of people who are detractors of your brand, which is people who score you from 1 to 5. And the higher that number is, the better your reputation is. And according to Reichheld's research, the better your future performance will be. Now, I'm a huge fan of Net Promoter Score for a couple of reasons. The first is that I think it is a simple and elegant way of summing up reputation. Um, it obviously, um, in order to become a diagnostic tool, requires a lot more questions about why people feel that way. But as a way of keeping score, it's a pretty powerful tool. Um, and secondly, because I think that public relations can influence <coughs> net promoter score in a major way, um, it is almost impossible for me to envisage an advertising campaign that makes a substantial impact in net promoter score for an established product. I'm not sure that there's anything you can do with a 30 second commercial and a jingle that will make me recommend a brand to a, fir to, to a friend. But there are a lot of things that you can do with public relations. Um, I just got, uh, just got done uh, judging a bunch of entries to our awards competition today. Uh, there was a campaign submitted on behalf of Ben & Jerry's, uh, which despite the fact that it is now part of a huge national conglo international con conglomerate, uh, Unilever, ran a pretty funky campaign in, um, in Vermont last year in which uh, to celebrate the fact that Vermont, Vermont now allows same-sex marriage, mm -hmm. renamed Chubby Hubby Hubby Hubby, and really kind of went out on a limb uh, in, and, and illustrated my point from a little earlier about companies having values and acting as if they have values and believing in those values, even though they may upset people. Um, now, there's a PR campaign that I suspect made a fairly significant proportion of the Vermont population more likely to recommend Ben & Jerry's to their friends, to say this is a great company. The other thing um, that I think probably made several others less likely to recommend Ben & Jerry's, but that's the way life goes, right? Um, the second thing is, 
the, the second thing uh, that, that feeds into that is that it makes it absolutely clear that in today's environment, treating public relations and customer service as separate disciplines is a huge mistake. And when I talk about earlier about the consolidation of public relations, it seems to me that one of the things public relations people are going to have to take responsibility for in the future that mostly they don't have now is the customer service function. Because as, as I said, I think that customer service people have the ability to really screw up your reputation in a big way. If you're responsible for reputation, you have to have control over that. Uh, there are companies where that is beginning to happen, including and the second time I've mentioned them today, Dell, um, where the, the crisis of the last sort of two years has led them to that conclusion. Um, those are, I think, some of the important challenges facing our business today. There are probably some others. I hope we have time to discuss them in Q&A. Um, but I wanna, I wanna leave you with just a quick sort of notion about this business. Um, when I started writing about public relations, it really didn't occur to me uh, that I was gonna spend 25 years of my life doing it. I had initially seen it as a stepping stone uh, from local newspapers to writing about politics for The Guardian. Um, I felt my ability to uh, uh, analyze politicians, piss off conservatives, and insert at least one typo into every story made me a perfect fit for Britain's leading left-wing rag. Um, never got there, obviously, uh, for several reasons. One is that public relations, uh, the main one is that public relations is a great business to be involved in and to write about. Um, it's a great business because from a journalist's point of view, you can write about literally everything. Um, if I want to do a story on the New York Mets and maybe get to meet a couple of players, not that they have any left, um, I, can, uh, I, I can write a story ab about, uh, about their PR setup. If I want to do a film story, I can go to Hollywood and write about their PR people. If I want to do a story about NASA, I can go to NASA and write about their PR people. Uh, it's a wonderful, all-encompassing industry. It's a business of ideas. Um, it's not like manufacturing widgets. It's, an, it's a business that is constantly changing, that um, is as much about your philosophy of how business should be run um, as it is about any kind of process. Um, it is also a business which even today contributes to corporations to only a tiny fraction of its ability. Um, I keep telling people that I think most organizations, even now, are using public relations to about 20% of its ability to really contribute. They're still using it primarily as a communications function, which means primarily as a means of disseminating messages, rather than as a guiding principle by which to run their businesses. And the final thing is that I really believe that public relations is one of the most important significant forces in society. I think that public relations at its core is about aligning the interests and behavior of institutions with the expectations of the society in which they operate. You can do that two ways. You can do that by changing the behavior of organizations. You can do it by changing the expectations of society. But whichever way you do it, it is an incredibly uh, powerful tool for social harmony. And at, and at a time when corporations in particular exercise a massive amount of influence over the way in which we all live our lives. Uh, I don't think it's ever been more important. Um, I wrote an article um, in the depths of the recession in which I said that despite the fact that last year was an incredibly tough year for the public relations industry, we are about to enter a golden age for public relations. I still believe that to be true. I think that for all the reasons I've discussed today, public relations is about to become one of the most important functions within organizations. Whether public relations people can take advantage of that <laughs> remains to be seen. And if they can't, then there's something that I've seen happen over the years that I think will continue to happen, which is that pub the corporations will say public relations is important. It's too important to be left to public relations people. Let's give it to a marketer. Let's give it to an HR guy. Let's give it to a CFO. Let's, God help us, give it to a lawyer. Um, hopefully, the people in this class who are learning about public relations the right way from my, I won't say old friend, but good friend, Shelley, um, will help to prevent that happening because I'd much rather be writing about you in 10 years' time than writing about a bunch of lawyers. Thank you very much Great. indeed you. for your patience.